So I suggest we move on with the spatial cross-validation thing. Um, does everybody know what spatial cro or what cross-validation is? Who does know cross-validation? Okay, quite a few, but some are not re. Uh, we will repeat it a, a little bit at least. Before we do that, let's. Okay, these are um, the packages we will use: SF Raster, MLR, Ranger, uh, QGIS, and Parallel Map. And the slides and the code can again be found on our geostats underscore 18 repository. And before we are talking in a little bit about spatial cross-validation, let's start out with the study area, um, the data we have at hand, and the aim of our actual um, modeling. And then I will introduce you shortly to spatial cross-validation. Um, and have you heard of MLR before? So machine learning with R, it's a package. One, two. So a few people already know it. MLR is a, is a meta package. So I think all of you know that you can build models in multiple ways and hundreds of ways, and there are uh, many, many packages out there which lets you model. There's LM, or the stats package, maybe the most famous, and then we have GLM, and then we have the MGCV package for GAM, and then we have the Ranger package for, it's one implementation of Random Forest, but there are uh, many other packages doing Random Forest stuff. E1071, if I remember correctly, is, is another example. Then we have support vector machines, we have neural networks, so there are really many, many approaches to do modeling in R. And not all of those package, but packages, but some of them come with their own interfaces. So, um, and MLR is streamlining all of this, so that you can just specify um, we would like to model this using this and this data, and then we would like to do a cross-validation, and it is using um, MLR building blocks for this. So it is streamlining the process, and no matter which package you're using. So this is the advantage of, of MLR, and another good advantage of it is that it allows spatial cross-validation, and um, there's another meta package, the carrot package maybe even more popular, but as far as I know, um, you can't do spatial cross-validation with the carrot package. Um, and there was other reasons why um, Patrick, Patrick has implemented the spatial cross-validation MLR, and why he chose MLR. Um, yeah, after we have had a look at MLR building blocks, I will introduce those building blocks with LM, so with a linear model. Um, I think everybody of you know how to use an LM, so I think this is a good introduction to, to the MLR building blocks, so that you get a, an idea how to use them, and then we will use these building blocks using a random forest model. And yeah, uh, I think we will see a a surprising result, or maybe not that surprising. Good. Um, study area, data and aim. The study area is located in northern Peru. It's exactly this mountain we have already visited when we computed our terrain attributes. It's the Mount Mongon. And as you can see, or I think most of you will know, that the coastal strip of Peru and also down to Santiago de Chile in Chile um, is just a desert, it's a coastal desert, so there are not much plants to be found, but still there are some uh, fog oases, so some mountains where you can find um, plants. And just to give you an impression how it looks like, this is um, also summer, uh, and this is the Mount Mongon in summer, so you wouldn't expect there are many plants to live. And to be honest, when I first went there, I saw it like this, and I didn't even know, or I, I asked myself if it is a good idea to bring a tent, because why? But then I was happy that I brought one, because in, in Austral winter it looks like this, so um, it's really, really foggy. You can't see more than 30 meters, and 
um, suddenly there are really, really many plants. Really incredible, very, very fascinating vegetation. And, and what is even more interesting is that they are, in fact, living um, from the fog. So it is not really raining. There's the fog, and they just comp it out. And so they um, channel it to their roots. And this is how they receive mainly their, their water input. Of course, El Nino and La Nina, so and so episodes also play a role. But in normal years, um, they mostly receive their water input from fog. Okay, so what did we do there? On this mountain, I had this study area, and I randomly distributed 100 plots, and um, I was lucky that this was possible because um, I would never do this again, because why would you randomly sample 100 points on a mountain slope? It's just a silly idea. It's a good idea in terms of statistics, but a silly idea if you have to go there. <laughs> And, but it worked out here on another mountain, it didn't. The, we had to use a transect because we couldn't reach our, our points. But here in this case it was possible. And in each of these plots, uh, one plot is four by four meters in size, uh, we determined each vascular plant species. And our response will be the first and on the x-axis. Uh, do we have ecologists here? One, just one, two, quite a few. And are you familiar with NMDS, so non-metric multidimensional scaling? No? Never heard? Um, but I think most of you have heard of principal component analysis. So principal component analysis is just a dimension reducing technique. Um, and so you, I'm not sure, will I talk about this later on? I guess not, so we have to do it here. <laughs> um, yeah, principal component analysis. So you have data, um, lots of data, lots of columns, and um, the, the columns are related to each other, so there's some kind of collinearity and there's some noise in it and you just want to extract the main information so you want to reduce the dimensionality. It's frequently used also in remote sensing, for example, with hyperspectral um, images where you have hundreds of channels and they, many of them have, carry more or less the same information, then you want just to extract the main information so you reduce the dimensionality. And for this, you can use the principal component analysis. And in ecology, or, or one um, PCA does assume linear relationships between the variables, between the columns. And this might be sensible in the case of remote or in the case of hyperspectral data. Um, also, it might be sensible in the case of soil data. But if you think of vegetation data, yeah it's not really a good idea because plants um, usually show a unimodal pattern along a gradient. So they have, it looks like this. So here they don't like to live, then there's somewhere, yeah, here it's really good to live, and there, no, we don't like to live there. And um, so we have to somehow account for this kind of nonlinearity, and there are several techniques in ecology which can reduce dimensions using or um, ac while accounting for nonlinearity. And one method is DCA, detrimental correspondence analysis, and another is non-metric dimensional scaling. It doesn't really matter. You just have to know, OK, we have columns, and our columns are species, let's say 100, and then we have 86 plots, and we just want to extract the main floristic gradient of these of this data table, and we do this by using uh, NMDS. And we use an NMDS because it is also able to handle nonlinear relationships. And if we are lucky, we can explain this just one axis, most of the variance of the whole data table. This is the um, meaning of um, dimension redu uh, yeah, reductions. OK? And this will be our. Um, response variables. So we have the first NMDS axis, so uh, the main gradient extracted by an NMDS, and we will predict it using 
our environmental data. Yes, and what next? Spatial cross-validation, of course, to retrieve a bias-reduced estimate of the model's performance. Um, this is also a very, very important point. Um, spatial cross-validation, or the aim of spatial cross-validation is to, uh, to get a bias-reduced estimate of the model's performance. The, the idea is not to do a spatial prediction. Um, so you have some performance measure. Uh, we will use here uh, R miss E, or if you, uh, so root mean squared error, or we could also use the R squared, or in the case of categorical data, you usually use an ROC, so the area under the receiver operator characteristics curve. Um, it's just a measure how good uh, has my model fitted the input data. But we will have a look at the spatial prediction in the code section of this tutorial. And since we are using random forests, you have used random forests in this, in this week, I guess. Hannah, have you explained in detail? Um, has Tom? No. Do you know what a random forest is? Who does not know? <laughs> So everybody knows, perfect. So what is a random forest? <laughs> it's quite mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> now, does everybody know a little bit how it works? It, it is, well, let's have a look at the book. I've written it down, and it's just a very, very quick introduction to it. Um, but that we are to, to make sure that we are all on the same page, it's maybe a good idea just to have a short glance at random forests. Ah, reducing, reducing dimensionality, I've written it down here as well, so you can reread it again. Um, but now we are looking for random forests. So modeling the gradient. So a random forest is just a tree-based method. And here, um, I use a simple tree. Um, and I use as my response variable the first NMDS axis. So it's a score, because it's called scores. Um, so SC. And just to explain tree-based methods, I just used one variable, in this case, DEM, so the altitude. And um, in what do they do? So there's some kind of variance minimizing, and according to this minimization, they split the data into different um, knots and trees. For example, in this case, everything which is below 330 meters, more or less, um, will be put into this knot. And in this knot, the SC, that is our uh, score, is the mean of this score is minus one. And then in another tree, we split the altitude in observations below 677 meters and those which are above. And then we will find in this tree all oh, the mean of those observations found in this knot is minus zero zero six, and then we split it again, and so on. And what we see in this case is that um, the score steadily increases with altitude. So this is just a tree, and you can use more than one variable. You can use as many as you want, and. Um, the problem of this approach is that it tends to overfit the data. So it fits quite closely the data. So if it's like this, it will also follow this. And this is not good for predictions because, um, no, it's just bad. It will not predict good on unknown, unseen data. And to account for this, the next thing was to introduce bagging. And bagging, what is bagging? I have to think about this as well. Mm. The, the, the thing is that you, to, to make it better, you run the model over and over again in different 
um, runs, and you use only a subset of the data. And then you say, OK, now fit the data with, I don't know, say 80% of the data, and then fit it with 85%, and so on and so on. And you, you do it multiple times, and then you average the predictions. And this is already better than just using the tree-based method. And finally, a random forest is nothing else but saying for each tree you can use, you cannot use all variables, which I give you. And in the case of bagging, it will use all available variables. In the case of random forests, it will just use a random subset of the available predictors. This, these are random forests. In fact, quite easy. I, I hope you agree. Uh, just reread it. It's, it's really a simple method. Um, it's astonishing how, how good it performs. So questions on that. So now, or are we all on the same page regarding random forests? More or less. So now you know it's a tree-based method, then there's bagging, and there's also a bit of uh, random variable selection for each vari um, model run. And then we um, average everything. This is a random forest. And it's good that we have spoken about this because afterwards we have to tune hyperparameters and um, to know what these hyperparameters mean, we have to know what this random forest is actually doing. So, fine. Yeah, okay, before we go to the hyperparameter tuning, which is also a great difference between parametric and non-parametric methods, um, we will just introduce the MLR building blocks. And I think before we do that, we will have a short cleanse and spatial cross-validation. So, um, what is the aim of cross-validation before we move on to the spatial part? Cross-validation, why do we do that? Uh, I think I have all, yeah? Yeah, um, very good. So much detail. I, I would just say in the beginning, um, why do we use it? We use it because we would like to know how good is our model at predicting um, new observations, how generalizable is our model. And if you want to do predictions, it's a good idea to know um, if it's fitting too closely our input data. If it does, it will not um, have a good predictive performance. We just want something smoother, so which is not following each um, noisy pattern. And to do this, as you, you said, we just split our data. And we use um, test and training data. And usually, it's around 20% um, that we use as test data. So we um, just remove this data from our, from our input data set and we use the remaining 80% to build our model and then we use the model to predict the outcome um, of the test data. And then since we know what the outcome is, we can, uh, we can uh, just calculate an error measure. So how close are we to the, to the actual data? And since we have taken the data out of our learning, um, it is unseen data, and this will give us an impression of how generalizable our model is. And usually, you do it randomly. So what you do is um, 100 repeated five-fold cross-validation is a very typical use case. There's also three-fold, but doesn't matter. In this case, five-fold and so, 20% um, of the data is used as test data, and therefore we have five folds, so each data point will be used once as a test point. And then we do this 100 times, so in total we fit 500 models. And then we know more or less how good our model is at predicting unseen data. So, um, I already have put here the random partitioning. So you see, oh, okay, it is randomly chosen, but still there are a few problems when it comes to spatial data. Um, 
A fundamental, fundamental assumption of cross-validation is that the data is independent of one another. And in space, you all know the first law of geography, I guess. It is just says that things closer to each other are more similar to each other than things farther apart. So they are not independent of each other. And here we see already, OK, this is quite close to the training data. And they're also, and um, yeah, the problem with this is that it's not independent any longer. And this subsequently leads to over-optimistic, that means biased results. It's like a peak glance at the outcome. So it shouldn't be known before the data, but we already have it in our, in our model. So this shouldn't be the case. And the solution to this problem, or it's not the solution, it is one approach to retrieve a, a biased reduced assessment of the model's performance is to use spatial partitioning. And this looks like this. So in this case, again, we have five folds, but the different folds uh, are spatially disjoint partitions. Uh, you can see here we have one partition as test data, and here another, data, and here again another. And the thing is, um, it's just a bias reduced measurement because, again, there are a few observations which are quite close to our, to our test data. But still, it gives better uh, non optimistic uh, optimistic results than using the random partitioning. So this is our introduction to spatial cross-validation. So it's just an extension of um, conventional cross-validation. Instead of randomly partitioning the data, we are using spatial partitions. And the spatial partitions, again, are used using um, k-means clustering. Um, so a quite simple approach. And now that we know what spatial cross-validation is and why we use it, we can apply it. So let's load a few or attach a few packages, MLR, dply, and SF. And I have already created a response predictor matrix or data frame. I call it RP, response predictor. And here we have our SC. SC is our response variable, so our um, NMDS score, the first axis. And these are our four predictors, and you remember these were exactly the variables we have computed in the previous session. So here is again the catchment slope, the catchment area, the altitude, and the normalized difference vegetation index. And in the case of MLR, well, it forces you to explicitly tell it that we are having spatial data, and it requires the coordinates um, to come in an individual data frame uh, where, which is just named X and Y. So it doesn't accept SF objects or SP objects. You have to say, this is our response predictor matrix, and these are the corresponding coordinates. Um, if you don't give the coordinates, then it would be impossible to do the spatial uh, partitioning. Good. OK. Um, yeah, let's have a short glance at, at the data. I always think this is a good idea, especially if you only have four or five predictors. If you have a hundred, well, still then, um, it's always a good idea to get a feeling for, for the data that you have at hand. And what we see here is on the y-axis against our, again, our response, and on the x-axis we have our uh, predictors. And yes, in the case of Altitude, there's a slight nonlinear relationship. And in the case of catchment area, also NEVI looks really strange because, yeah, could be, could be this or could be this, so maybe not the best predictor. And catchment slope, yeah, more or less linear. So the, the predictors we are using here, there, yeah, there is an indication of, of nonlinearity, but not too much. So maybe an LM wouldn't be that bad after all. Um, still, I would guess if you fitted an LM and then had a look at the residuals plotted against the response and the predictors used in the model, I think you would still see um, nonlinear patterns. 
But since we are only interested in, in spatial prediction and we do not want to interpret our coefficients, um, it doesn't matter. Um, we can just skip this. This is really the beauty of machine learning. <laughs> you can just throw data at it and there comes an output and you don't have to interpret it or shouldn't even. Oh, well, there are approaches, but normally you, you shouldn't do that or, or very carefully. Good. Um, as I have told you before, MLR has building blocks. So we, it's a meta package and comes with building blocks. We have our data. We split it into test and training data. We define a learner, so a stati statistical learning method, such as LM, GLM, or random forest. We fit the model. Um, we do the prediction. And then we have a look uh, how good our prediction is using our test data. And then we do it over and over again. This is cross-validation. And finally, we will, re will retrieve um, a mean value for, for our performance measure. Good. So the first thing to do is creating a task. Then we have to define a learner. We have to specify a resampling strategy and also a performance measure. And these are the, the main building blocks. So let's start with a, with a task. Um, you have several options in MLR. Uh, make regression task um, just means that you're using a continuous variable, as is the case in our, with our data, because the NMDS scores range or can range from minus to plus infinity. Um, so a regression would be a good idea. But if you have categorical data, then you should use not the regression task, but the classification task. And there are two further um, possibilities. And what we do is we say RP is our input data. In this input data, the SC column is our response variable, the target. And we also say, OK, we are in space. These are our coordinates. So uh, these coordinates will be used for the spatial partitioning. Um, now we just have to find uh, a learning technique that can be applied to our data. You can use the list learners function um, and putting our task in it, and then it will return all the available learners for this regression task. And as I said before, uh, I think at the moment there are, you can almost fit more than 200 models using MLR. So I don't list them all here, but if you are interested, just run this code. I already know that the learner is named regression.lm. Um, and we make the learner in, with the make learner function. And we say also our response or the, the prediction should be our, uh, the response and not the probability or anything else, but the response. So if you want to learn more about the learner itself, you can use get learner package. This will tell you from where the learner is coming from, from which package. And if you run help learner um, using the defined learner, then the corresponding help page will pop up. Uh, in our case, I just fitted this model here uh, like this using the MLR syntax to convince you that we're using the stats LM function. So really a simple linear model. Um, so if we put it here then the, in, into the help learner function, then the LM help will pop up. Okay. Now we have to find the task. We have also defined a learner. And uh, what is missing is our spatial partitioning, our cross-validation. And we can define the resampling technique using this function. And using SPRepCV means that we are using spatial repetitive cross-validation and we are using a 100 repeated five-fold cross-validation. So remember, this is one repetition. Five folds, one repetition, 
we do this 100 times. So we fit 500 models to find out about the performance um, of LM on unseen data. Yeah, and since we now have defined almost everything, the only thing missing is the performance measure. I used the root mean squared error. Um, we can run the resampling, and we have to specify, of course, the task, the learner, the resampling technique we are going to apply, and as uh, just said, also our performance measure. And then it will run 500 models, and in each case, it will give back a root mean squared error, which was computed on the test data. Good. Um, I called it cross-validation spatial LM, and if you have a look at the result, we see it took 2.5 seconds on my computer, and the mean RMS E is 0 0.43, and the question is, is that good or not? Any, any guesses? Is this good or not? Well, it depends on the range of our, uh, of our response. And the range is between minus 2 and plus 1, and so we can tentatively say the average deviation from, from the test data is around 14%. So, not that bad, it's okay. 14% deviation for an LM, yeah, it's good. Um, now, let's see if random forests can do better. <sighs> Much text here. Like many other machine learning algorithms, random forests have hyperparameters. These need to be tuned. And um, so, they are not estimated during the learning like it was the case here. We have seen that. These are the coefficients of the LM, and these are learned by the linear model. So in, in comparison to that, uh, machine learning algorithms are not learned from the data, but they are specified uh, in the beginning. So we have to tell the random forest, use these and these hyperparameters, and then do your prediction. And um, it's a good question how we can retrieve optimal hyperparameters, and there are various approaches, and here I just uh, show one approach. Um, and it is a random search. So what we do is we specify for several hyperparameters a range within which these hyperparameters can fall, and then we randomly choose values for, from these ranges and then run 50 models and then we just have a look at the model which gave back the best prediction. And then we use these hyperparameters to do our performance estimation, so to calculate the RMS E, so how good our model is on predicting unseen data. Yeah, we, we will see this in a moment again, so I will repeat this. <clears throat> okay, um, in fact, we can use the ex exact same task because it doesn't change, it's a regression task. Um, we use the same input data, the response remains the same, and we are going to do spatial cross-validation again, so this remains just the same. Um, but what we need to change is our learner. We have used regression.lm, and now we would like to use the... I forgot an R here. We, we would like to use the regression ranger, and this regression ranger um, is running a random forest model. So here we just specify, or we replace regression LM by regression, regression ranger, and we also use the same... Uh, prediction type, and then we can run this model. Um, the performance level remains exactly the same, so we have again uh, our five-fold 100 repeated cross-validation, but 
now we need to tune the hyperparameters. So before we can do the prediction here, we need to know what are optimal hyperparameters. And yeah, uh, now it's it's not really complex. You just have to to remember that we can't. Well, we can if we if we estimated the optimal hyperparameter combination from the. Do we have a picture here? Here we have a picture. So you already know this. This is our performance estimation. So our five folds, we split the data into here 20% test data, 80% um, training data, and we do this for uh, five times. And if we now computed our optimal hyperparameters on the full data set, the full data set we will use for the prediction, then it is also a bit like cheating. So to prevent this, we have to use an inner loop. And what we are going to do is we are splitting this data again into five subfolds and estimate the hyperparameters on this data by predicting on these test data. And then we um, use the optimal hyperparameter combination we found here to do the prediction for this data. Yeah, this is called nested cross-validation. Um, yeah, you just have to get your head around it. It's not really complicated. You just have, I had to read it two or three times. And, but once you get around it, it's not, it's not really complex. It's just a bit nested, nothing more. Um, and what it means, also is um, here we have again five subfolds. In each of these subfolds, we are running 50 models with random hyperparameter combinations. And this turns out to be 250 models. And the combination out of these 250 models will be again used for using the prediction in the first fold. And then we are doing this again. So Hyperparameter tuning is really computationally intensive, and if you have a large data set, well, you might run into problems. Or you, you use parallelization in the cloud, then it might be alleviated, but yeah, it's really computationally intensive. So in total, just for these, for one repetition, we already five times 250 models to 1,250 models. Um, just for one repetition, then times 100, so we end up with 125,000 uh, 125, models. And then, on top of this, comes our performance estimation, so again, 500 models. So in total, 125,500 models. So before you run the code, know what you do. <laughs> um, or, well, you can also have patience. Good questions. More or less clear? Yes. About the subfolds for tuning the parameters, are they spatial as well or just randomly selected? In the hyperparameter fold? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. It's spatially. Again, it's spatial. Okay. Yeah, again, spatial. Um, Patrick, um, the first author of the paper where this figure is also from, has done, well, he loves computations. <laughs> and he also tested everything against everything, and he also tested spatial performance level um, estimation and non-spatial hyperparameter tuning and what is the effect of this. And in the end, he says it's good to do it spatially in all cases. So it, it's not strictly necessary because often, especially with random forest, the default values are quite good. So it just works. Um, but you never know. And um, you will have other results using the spatial cross-validation. And just to be on the safe side, use spatial-spatial cross-validation or nested spatial cross-validation. Yes? Uh, is there a way to add also, to do like kind of temporal spatial partitioning using the MLR? So Pardon? Using the make resample desk, the, the function, to add also the if there are a temporal uh, 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 correlation. Ask Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that, in fact, it would be the next step because this is just now spatially. Yeah. Um, and now uh, 
uh, yeah, it is possible. It is not implemented, but it wouldn't be that well. In detail, it is hard, but yeah, it's not, you can implement this. But MLR does not allow that. It's not so far. It's not, it's, it's not supported. Okay. But I think it's the next step. Sorry, just to clarify, so the tuning stage... Do I mean what? The, the, the tuning is within each fold of the cross-validation. So you have your... Take your validation data out, and then this... You're tuning the hyperparameters hyper in each fold. Yeah, so what we do is here we have our first, um, here, this is the test data, mm. um, this is our training data. Sure. Then we put it in an inner fold and using these data here as, um, and split it again into five partitions. So it's an inner tuning, but using only this data for the first fold. So, what are your rules for stop for finishing the tuning? Then? Do you have some convergence or convergence? Yeah. How do you know? How do you know when to finish? How many? How many iterations do you have in this tuning cycle? Yeah, I will show you in a second. But as I said, is um, fifty. I said random search with fifty iterations. So you have fifty, 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 um, two hundred fifty models just for one fold. Other questions? Another question. Uh, as you has, uh, has explained, for each fold, when we split the data for creating hyperparameter, hyperparameter in the next fold, this hyperparameter might change. So what are you going to do at the end? Are you going to ignore all of these parameters that has been calculated and calculate no, once again? Or? No, what you do is you run these 250 models, mm -hmm. then you have one optimal hyperparameter combination, and you use it just for this fold. And then you go to the next fold, and you do it again. And you just, again, use the, per, the optimal hyperparameter combination from this fold for the second fold. And so this is the reason why you have so, so many models. That's, it, this will end, will result to five hyperparameters because each, each fold has one set of, or one single best hyperparameter. Yes. And at the end of five-fold cross-validation, there will be five optimum hyperparameter. Yeah, but always for this specific fold, but it's just for this specific fold. And we are not really interested, well, you can have a look how the hyperparameters range, but we are actually interested in doing, or we are using these hyperparameters to do the prediction on the yeah. test data and to, and to see how good is it. Yeah, hmm. but the final, the final purpose of these activities is to predict to somewhere else, on a raster or on a space that we don't have the data of. Yeah, no, it is so, not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we no, need to this end is, up with a model that could predict better on the other side, not the no, it's, I know, I know exactly what you mean, and <laughs> it's really confusing because you yeah, have yeah. so many hyperparameter combinations, and which one of all of these combinations should I use? At um, the end, in, yeah. in, in the end, we have 500 different hyperparameter combinations, and which one should we use? Um, for spatially predicting, mm -hmm. but we don't use them at all. This is, but we, feel, we will see this later. For the spatial prediction, um, the, the aim for the spatial prediction is not the performance estimation, which is the aim of spatial cross-validation. Yep. Then the aim is spatial um, prediction. And for this reason, we tune the hyperparameters on the full data set because we are predicting anyways into space from which we don't have information, so we can, can just use all the data. So at the end, when we want to predict on rasters, we need to calculate... I show you. This, this, this comes later. Yeah, okay. it, this is the, the code example. Um, here we're just, using, uh, we're just doing performance estimation, and then in the code section we will see how we tune hyperparameters for spatial prediction. Yeah, okay. 
Um, is it possible to visualize the spatial resampling during the folds, just so we can get an idea of, um, you had a nice ggplot visualization it's earlier. It's not ggplot. It's not ggplot, okay. No, of course not. Like not. <laughs> um, um, and that's one question. Can we do this as well? Without well, you could, but what happens, it doesn't matter because in each repetition, this slightly, slightly changes. It always looks a bit like this. Uh, it just randomly, but you could. If you wanted, you could do this. Okay. But then you would end up with so, so many different visualizations just showing um, different variants of this. Of course, it changes slightly, or sometimes it's even a big change, but um, yeah. it's just random. That would just help with the intuition, perhaps, just to get an idea of what this is actually doing. Um, yeah. And the second question would be, could you explain again um, the mean deviation from the true value as an indicator of model performance? I couldn't quite get the intuition of what that means. It's on slide 24. Say it again. The RMSE. Yeah, I mean, well, RMSC is, but um, on slide 24 you have... Um, 20, 20 what? Slide 24. 24. Yep, just one more. I think you've got... And again, um, just that value at the bottom, could you, could you perhaps just help, help me try and understand what that's telling me? Is, is that a percentage? Is yes. It, it's a percentage. Yeah. What I do is... Um, here, this is the mean aggregate over, in this case, it was an LM over the 500 models. So we have 500 RMSEs, and the, this dot aggregate is just the mean of the 500 RMSEs. Um, well, now one could argue, is it a good idea to use the mean? Well, probably not, but it's better to have a look at the, at the box plot, so you can see that we will do this later on also. Um, and then what I'm doing is just to use this range, um, calculating the difference, so it's uh, around 3.03, and divide, uh, divide our mean arm is AE by the 3.03 and multiply by 100. So this gives you an idea of the mean deviation um, per prediction. So in, on average, our prediction is 14% off the real value. So we move on. Mm, yeah, right. Now we wanted to do the random forests and we talked in detail about the hyperparameter tuning. Um, as I said, it might be a bit overwhelming in the beginning, but once you get your hand around it, it's really easy. The concept is really easy. I hope this is encouraging. <laughs> um, and you can also reread this in chapter 11 of our book because there I have written it down. Or you can ask me afterwards if, if there's still something unclear. Um, so the thing we now need to do is to specify our random search. And for one, we have also to say, um, do this. And in this case, we just use five different, or five spatial partitions. We don't do this over and over again, just once. And in each of these partitions, we run 50 times the model. And you do this by saying, by setting this max it or the make tune control random to 50. So this just says use 50 models in each of these folds. Good. Um, right, and now we need to define the tuning space. And I just did it here in, in accordance with the literature of the proposed values. M try, sample fraction, and min not size, these are also the hyperparameters recommended in the, in the literature to, to tune. Um, read this paper of Probst et al. It's really a nice read. It just um, explains what random forests are, what implementations are out there, and then they compare 
different hyperparameter tuning strategies um, against each other, and then they come up with this um, with this recommendation. And m try sample fraction min not size. M try. M try, um, maybe you remember in the beginning when we talked about random forests, I said random forests um, extend boosting by saying um, you cannot use all predictors in each tree. Um, maybe you can. Um, we set this randomly. Um, and for this, we use the M try parameter. So the lowest value would be to use just one predictor, and the highest value here is to use all predictors. So all predictors would be just bagging. And because here, end call RP, remember in our response predictor matrix, we also have the response variable. So this is why I here see say minus one. So I say randomly choose one to four predictor variables in each um, three run. And the sample fraction, this was what I told you in the bagging. When you run multiple models, you just use a subset of the data, and we let it range between 20 and 90%. So there are models which are just using 20% of the input data, and there are models which are using 90%. And min not size, this is the terminal knot, if I remember correctly. And, but I have to look it up. I'm not quite sure. I think it's how many observations must be to be found at least in the terminal knot. So we go back, 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 back. The terminal knot is... I know, this was not here. It was easier. Here. Here, these are terminal knots. These are terminal knots, and this parameter here just makes, says how many observations have to be at least in each terminal knot. And we here say it's, I think, 1 to 10. And this should be chosen again randomly. So this is also the reason why it's called random forest, because we randomly select the number of predictors. Um, in the bagging, we randomly select the number of observations to be included in the modeling. And then we randomly say how many observations have to be at least part of the terminal knot. So. Um, yeah, uh, literature. As I pointed out, this is a really, really good paper on random forests. And if you want to know more about statistical learning, um, what are parametric, non-parametric models, what's the difference between machine learning and, well, this is, I think they don't really explain it. They, they call it statistical learning. So what's the difference between different machine learning algorithms um, such as random forests or artificial neural networks or um, support vector machines, then have a look at this James et al. book. Um, it's called An Introduction to Statistical Learning. A really good book. Um, there, they also explain resampling in detail, so spatial, not spatial, but cross-validation. So if you want to reread cross-validation, you can also read this in an introduction to statistical learning with R. Yeah, that's the title. And of course, you can have a look at geocomputation with R in chapter 14. At least we give a, a short introduction to all of this stuff. But if you want to know more, these are quite good reads. Yeah, OK, now that we have specified an inner loop, we um, need to wrap it up. So. Here we say that this is the learner. This is the resampling in the tune level, so in our um, inner fold. Um, these are the hyperparameter settings here. Remember here, this is PS, and this is control. Um, so this is our tuning space. This is um, saying use 50 iterations in the random search 
And again, also for the inner loop, we have to say what is the performance measure, because only then we will know uh, what is the optimal hyperparameter combination. Good. And finally, we can put it into the resample function. And then again, we put this wrapped learner RF uh, into this function. We tell this is the task, this is the performance level. In this case, it's the outer loop. So the 500 models to estimate the um, performance. And you don't have to do this, but if you're interested in the tuning results, you get them using the get tune result thing. And as performance measure, again, we are using the RMSE. But as I said, before you run this code, um, yeah, 125,500 models, um, maybe parallelization is a good idea, or you just go and grab many coffees. <laughs> I don't know. I think it doesn't take that long in this case, but um, because we just use 86 observations and four predictors, so this is still fast, but if you use thousands of observations and possibly hundreds of predictors, then uh, you should certainly parallelize this stuff and uh, use cloud computing. And finally, um, this is what I told you before. This is the output of our spatial cross-validation. So we, and this is the output I haven't shown you, but I have run also a conventional cross-validation that is using this random resampling. So um, you remember this picture in the beginning where the test and training data were close to each other. Um, and here you see that the conventional cross-validation has a lower RMSE, so it is over-optimistic, and especially you see in certain spatial partitions, the RMSE is really bad. So, for example, um, a good example is if you have a climate divide somewhere, and just by coincidence, your test data is um, put into this yeah, the test data is completely, um, let's say, on the wet side of your climate divide, and your training data is completely on the, on the dry side. Then probably the predictions from the dry side to the humid side will be really bad. Um, and this is what is happening here. I don't know which um, divides we have in this data set, but it would be interesting to explore. Good. Um, and what is really interesting is that now we have run 125,500 models. We end up with an RMIS E, which is worse than that of the simple linear model. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I would have preferred a, a, a better result. But then remember what random forests are used for. Um, normally, you use random forests for really big data. So for thousands of observations with tens or hundreds of variables where you really have no clue at all what the relationship and interactions between these predictors might be. And then it's a good idea just to put it into a random forest. Um, here we only have four predictors. And we also have seen in the beginning that the relationship is more or less linear. So an LM could cope with this. And therefore, I think this is a good explanation why um, the result is not as good in the random forest in this case. But it also tells you um, that complex models or machine learning models are not always better. And uh, you can always write, uh, OK, I used an LM, but I have tried a random forest if you must. So if just to convince the reviewer that you are able to run a random forest. But I think random forests are maybe even easier to run than LMs. Well, let's say they are as easy to run as LMs. <clears throat> you, you only, it's just different. In the case of LMs, you normally would begin to have a look at the coefficients, and then you would have a look at the p-values and 
um, at confidence intervals and stuff like this, and then you have problems with spatial autocorrelations, and you see, oh no, I can't interpret my coefficients because there's some kind of nonlinearity or um, dependence probably due to spatial autocorrelation, and then you have to make a model more, com more and more complex, and then in the end it's really a, a complex model, and then you can interpret your coefficients. And in the case of random forests, you have to tune your hyperparameters, and you have to do this before the learning begins, and therefore you have to know what are hyperparameters, what is the effect of the hyperparameters, um, how can we tune them. Uh, here I've just shown one method, the random search, but there are many other methods. So, and then if you are going to look for the best way, the most optimal way, then maybe you also have very, you have to spend much, much time to find, to find this way for you. So, yeah. You can say as easy or as difficult to run as LM, LMs, just depending on the context, what you are after. Yeah, uh, we could add further environmental predictors, we could also add XY coordinates as predictors, and then maybe the results would change. Good, um, and now, uh, in fact, this is the prediction map using the random forest. A really nice map, I think, because here you see the floristic gradient, and each of these colors represent uh, a different kind of vegetation belt, I say. Here in the lower part, the blue part, this is really desert, 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 there's sand and there's a few Tilansa species. Then here the fog begins and then you have some grassy species and some Nolana. Do you know Nolana? Solana Zin. Um, these are the tobacco plants. <laughs> Good. And here below the temperature inversion, there also you find the higher species diversity. Um, there um, is another vegetation belt, um, I called it, or in accordance with the literature, the bromeliad belt, so there are many bromeliads, so pineapple plants, and on the top, so just above the inversion, so where no fog is anymore, then the vegetation becomes more dry again, and you find cactus plants and stuff like this. Yeah, but a really great prediction map, so because it just resembles the five vegetation belts, and then there's also a very interesting finding uh, here, this interruption of this uh, most diverse plant belt, and yeah, I, you wouldn't have noticed this without the spatial prediction. Um, it's really interesting, and I also would like to know why this is, and yeah, I will think about it. And because it was also your question, in the tutorial we will just create this prediction map, and so we will see how we can tune the hyperparameters for spatial prediction. Okay, questions? So now we can just move on and do the code stuff, or you can also have a look at at the code I've just presented. Yes? Yeah, it seems that the spatial cross validation, you say that the conventional one is too optimistic, but it seems that you risk having a pessimistic evaluation with the spatial cross validation because you remove entire chunks from your data spatially and you have to extrapolate into that space. Um, yeah, that's exactly the point. But it's not pessimistic, it's reality. We want to know how good is our model on, predicted, on predicting unseen data. So data it hasn't seen before. And if we don't do the spatial cross-validation, then we always have this over-optimistic um, over problem because, as I said in this, um, as I said in this example with the climate divide, wet and dry, so if you have a few observations in the wet area, then you have already a peak glance at the results. Yeah, but if you would sample at random, you would sample in that space. No, but you sample it randomly just in, in the tabular way, but not in space. This is exactly the point why we're doing spatial cross-validation. Yeah, I get that, but you... you... <laughs> Normally, with the prediction, you want to interpolate within the space of your data. Yeah, but the, also the other thing with 
cross-validation is, or the main assumption of cross-validation is that your test data is independent of the training data, which is not the case if you have observations which are close to each other due to spatial autocorrelation. So the result of a conventional non-spatial um, cross-validation... Sure, but, but that's another point. That's another point. Um, my point was with the spatial cross-validation, you remove these entire chunks from your data set and you then try to predict into those areas and you, you're actually extrapolating into those areas and you may end up with an overly pessimistic um, prediction, um, estimate of your prediction accuracy because you've taken, um, you've taken those data points out. Yeah, but this is exactly what you do in cross-validation. You randomly take out data. And now we do it just in space to make sure it's independent, the training and the test data. Okay, maybe I could express it a different way. <laughs> um, you may get a more realistic estimate of how bad your prediction could be with the spatial model, but because you don't include those data in, your, in, in the training of your model, you may you're removing data that could give you a better prediction. Yeah, but it's... Yeah, it's this is the point, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's, yeah. Well, I think we basically mean the same. And I just say this is over-optimistic, you say it's pessimistic. And yeah, maybe you are a little bit right, um, but I, I wouldn't trust uh, the, the other model to... There is a good review in Roberts et al. 2017. They used several cases of temporal, spatial, and phylogenetic, I guess, uh, data with simulated data, and they showed that <coughs> spatial cross-validation shows a better result, shows a more realistic result than random cross-validation. And it depends, and they explain it a little bit about the size of the blocks, but Specifying the size, the optimal size of the blocks is always a problem, how big the block should be. So if they are too big, as you say, it makes it more pessimistic than the result. So you cannot trust in, in the prediction. However, the prediction might be good. So it depends on, on the, the size of the chunk that you are taking out. If the chunk is not too big, it makes more sense. Result if the chunk is not big enough, you still get spatial autocorrelation at the boundaries yeah. of the chunk. Yeah. So finding the, the optimal size of the, the chunk or the blocks is a, a challenge at the moment. And I just wanted to add... Yeah, uh, I think in, in any case, you're right. You can do other partitioning, and this is also worth of exploring, and maybe we should talk about this later on because... Yeah, no, I agree. <laughs> I think it's a very interesting question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and one thing, uh, I don't know, I wanted to add, there is a uh, package, I, I developed a package called Black CV, it's in my GitHub. There is several way of uh, calculating the, the faults for block cross valid spatial blocks, spatial leave one out and environmental blocks. So in that one, you can visually uh, plot the, the folds and you can visually select based on a, a um, shiny app how big your block you want to be. And you can use those, that size of the block to create the folds for block cross-validation or a spatial block cross-validation. There is an, another, Another function I developed here, it's, I cannot say this is the solution to the problem. Most of the time, uh, people feed the model, look at the residual, and check the autocorrelation range in the residual to see how autocorrelation, how autocorrelation affect the residual, and use that as a, as a block size to, uh, or as a distance to put between the training and testing sets. But the thing I have done, before you do any analysis, I check the autocorrelation between the predictor to see how this autocorrelation 
ease between, between the predictor you are using because at, at the end, when you want to check to see if the testing and training set are close to each other, the things that, that affect them is the autocorrelation in the predictor. So if this is, a, I don't know, a temperature, if the autocorrelation is too big, uh, even if you give a good space or a large space between your training and testing set, it will still affect your, your testing. So I don't say this is the solution, but this might give you an insight how big you should choose the block size. Okay, thanks. Another question. I want just to come back to his question. So you have a predictive map, but I, uh, how, uh, I mean, how you did, how you predict those points. I mean, are you using, like you have best final best parameters with the final hyperparameters? Or your hyperparameters depends also on space and then you predict also on space or? Yes, we will have a look at how we do this map now in a live code demo. Okay. So you, you'll see. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Last picture on my slide. This is the fog flag on this Mount Mongon. Really beautiful. And let's have a look at the code. Not this one. This one. Um, you can find this code again on this. No. On this GitHub thing, geocomb r, and on the geostats 18. Here under the code section, you will find spatial CV, and here you find also a file named 1MLR. So this is all the code we have sh seen in, in this presentation, and the last part of of this presentation is how to do the spatial prediction of our floristic gradient. So, this map. So, I just give you a second to find the code if you want to have a look at it um, right away. And here it is. So first, well, we start with a clean session, I propose. And first of all, we load a few packages. SF, Rasta, Dplyr, MLR, Vegan. The Vegan package is for vegetation, or for ecology. And in this package, you will find a function named MetaMDS, and this function lets you compute the NMDS, so this is the dimension reducing technique I've told you in the beginning. Um, these random points here, you remember we have created them in the previous session, so if I just run this, you see here is DM, there's NDVI, catchment slope, catchment area, and the geometry, so it's an SF object, and then we have two more columns we are here not really interested in. Um, then there's a data file named com, and if we look at com, we don't see much, um, but this is our community matrix. So in the rows, you find the visited plots, and in the columns, you find the found species. And if there's a zero here in plot one for um, this plant, then it means it wasn't there. Okay, this is our community matrix. Again, we load the DEM, and that is the altitude, raster, and study area. This is just outlining our study area. And what I also do is loading the environmental predictors. So we have created catchment slope and catchment area, and we have NDVI and ND and DEM, and I would like to put them into a raster stack. And there we go. And because we log transformed catchment area, we do so also here. 
And if you type EP, then you see it's a raster stack with four predictors. And we need these predictors for our spatial prediction because these are the predictors we are using in our model. So the first thing to do is um, running the NMDS and you do this um, using this command meta MDS and I say use 500 iterations to find an optimal solution. Um, K equals 4 means use 4 um, four score columns and we will just use the first column and if we ask for the stress we say, see it's around 9 and um, this is a good stress value. So all values below 15 or 0 0.15 are good NMDS values. So this means that our NMDS can extract or reduce our, our big data table to just four columns while retaining the most of the variance found in the original data matrix. Yes, and here's some stuff, rotating stuff. I won't explore, uh, explain it here in detail. Um, read the book chapter if you're interested in this. Um, here we just take it as granted. Um, next, I extract SC. So you see this is just the first column of our four NMDS axis, and then I join them to our random points. And this gives us this, and now we have another column named SC. Good. Um, in the, yeah, we, we should do this as well. As I have told you in the beginning, uh, if you're using MLR, you have to give the task a data frame containing the response and the predictors, and you have to give it a, a data frame containing just the coordinates. So here we have to convert our SF object into coordinates, which I do here. So I just extract the coordinates, I say um, be a data frame, and I say, um, so if you run this, then the, the output will have columns named X and Y with capital letters, and I just want to rename them to X and Y with, um, what's, the, what's the name? Robin, hey. the opposite of capital letters, minor letters, um, lower letters, lower case. Lower case. Yeah, this I is the name. Spanish then, minuscula. Minuscula. Yeah. Um, and then, in our response predictor matrix, I just keep the variables which we will use on the modeling. So I remove the ID column and I remove also the species richness column. And what I also do is I set the geometry to null because the MLR building blocks are expecting a data frame. And actually I haven't tried, but just in case. So now we are all set up and we could um, run all the spatial cross-validation. This is just the code I've presented to you during the last hour and we will now move to the predictive mapping. And for this, we create a task. Again, it's the same task we have used before. Again, we use our P as input data. SC should be our response. And we use spatial cross-validation, so we have to indicate a data frame containing the coordinates. In the second step, we specify a learner, and we use a random forest regression ranger, and um, here uh, we just split our data set into five folds, and we just use one repetition, um, and you can do it using the SPCV. 
because otherwise you would end up with multiple optimal hyperparameters. We just want to use one, and therefore we just use one repetition. Then in the inner, oh, it's not the inner fold. I'm sorry. Uh, we have to specify also the random search. Um, again, with 50 iterations, we are using the exact same um, hyperparameters and we tune this using these ranges, which I have explained before. So everything stays more or less the same. And then we can do the tuning. And for this, we can uh, run these tune params. And as I said before, we are using. In this case, the complete data set, and it's just 50 models, um, so pretty easy uh, and quite fast. And this is how we get the optimal hyperparameters for the spatial prediction. And after having done that, we use these estimated optimal hyperparameters in our um, learner. So here we specify the optimal m try, the optimal sample fraction, and the optimal knot size. You can also have a look at the optimal m try. In this case, it is four. And the optimal sample fraction, so how many observations should be used per tree, 89%. And the minimal knot size is 10. So the terminal knot should at least have 10 observations. So these are the optimal hyperparameters in this case. And now we have the learner. We can run, finally, the model. And in MLR, you use uh, a function called train for this. So we specify the learner, we specify the task, and this is our model. And now we can apply this model to our data. And our since the raster package does not support ranger models in its raster predict function. Um, we have to do it ourselves, and we do it by just creating a data frame out of our raster stack. So we convert our EP, you remember this is the raster stack, into a matrix, and then we convert it into a data frame. And then we can run our model on this new data. And this is exactly what we did here. And then we, play, uh, we, we put these values back into our prediction raster. And this is our prediction. So if we just plot it like this, it would look like this. And um, this is also interesting because here we are predicting also two areas we have not observed. And Maybe it's not a good idea. Probably not. So to just restrict the prediction to our study area, we are doing some stuff. And I would suggest to just have a look at the code. So we mask it. We're doing a hill shade. And then I use, in this case, lattice to do the spatial prediction. And I think. It's still not quite easy to do raster mapping using ggplot, or is it? I think not really. You could use tmap, is also a, a possibility. Yeah, this is our spatial prediction. Was it too fast, or have you other questions? So really, it's not that complicated. You just have to have a look at the code and um, do it again, and then you you will see what I've done there, hopefully. You can always ask me after um, the session as well. So if you have no questions, I would say we are done with this session. OK? I hope you enjoyed it a bit. Yeah. <laughs>